Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Thank you very much. Well, we have people from all over the country. Not people, they have family from all over the country. And I want to welcome them and welcome all of you. You know, it's wonderful to be with people who believe in Jesus and who know what God wills for them. Not too many people know that. You say, well, I don't know God's will for me. A lot of people tell me that. I thought tonight we'd do something a little different. Uh, I thought tonight we would look and see uh, what does God desire of each one of us in every state in life, okay? You have a professional state. We're going to take all the different categories, if you want to put it that way, all the states in life of different professions and, and see what does God want from us? What is his desire? We don't often think of God having desires. And you say, well, he can't have desires. He's everything and he has everything. But he desired to save us and he sent his son. He sent his mother, that Jesus left his, his mother and gave us to his mother. And he does have a desire that each one of us in our state in life become holy. Do what our dear Lord said in John 17. He said, may they all be one. Father, may they be one in us as you are in me and I am in you. <coughs> now, all of you think, well, that's for priests and religious. Oh, don't tell me that. He's saying all. Oh, that means everybody. Everybody has a different vocation. Some are single. Some are professional. Some have careers. Some are married. Some are priests, some are brothers, some are active order, and some are contemplatives. Some are ditch diggers. I have a great love for contractors and people who work with stone and steel because they do awesome things with their hands, you know. So I'm going to go over and see how can this, well, it's the 21st verse of John 17. How does it apply to you or to all these vocations? So God put us in one vocation. What does he desire of us? Now, let's say, for example, that I say, I don't know what desires. God has for me, okay? One thing we have to remember, each one of us, regardless of your vocation, has to imitate some part 
of God's life. Did you know that? Let's take the married life, okay? We'll start with that. It's a sacrament. Now, the married life resembles the Trinity in a most awesome way. The Holy Family lived it perfectly. But God's desire for all families are the same. And if we digress from that, we, we're disrupted. We cannot arrive at what God wants. Now let's take a father, a mother, and a few children. 10 or 12, if you have. What does God desire? Well, as you are a total imitation of the Trinity. A father is to imitate the eternal father. Say, well, how can I do that? Well, you provide, that's your duty. You provide, and the father provides, doesn't he, huh? The Lord said, don't worry about these things. The father knows you need them. We must begin now to have the ideal in our hearts and minds because we've long lost the ideal of family. So the, the man imitates the eternal father. He has to provide for his family. He creates. He looks after. He corrects. And he has a very special love as a father. A very special love. We all know how disrupted it is, but for this hour, let's not think of how bad things are. Let's look at God's ideal for you and me. So you as a family imitate the Trinity. A woman, oh, what is a woman? She brings life, new life. She's like, well, she's like Jesus. She excuses. She's a go-between. She's an advocate. The Jesus intercedes for us to the Father. She is noble because she takes the blame sometimes. And when your dad is kind of angry, she'll take the, the edge off. She is a friend. You have to be a friend with your mother. Because that warm love that you need to grow. She's a mortar between all the brick that make up your family. They make you a house, a home. She saves you from a lot of trouble. And she gets things for you your dad won't give you. She's an intercessor. She worries about you. Constantly prays that you don't goof off and lose your soul. She makes many sacrifices. How many of you have been educated by the labor and sweat of your mother and father, huh? Who made many sacrifices. A woman that is a mother and a wife has to make many, many sacrifices. So that's Jesus, see? That's the Trinity's will for you as a woman. Now, where's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit proceeds from Father and mother, from, I mean, from Father, Father, and Jesus, the eternal word. He proceeds. Well, all of you children come from your father and your mother. And that's love. Children ought to be loved, and they need to cement a mother and father's love for each other. Because you're looking at something that came from you. Children are not its. Children are not in the way. 
children are like the Holy Spirit. They come from love. They bind a mother and a father together better than anything else could. Because every time they walk across you, you're reminded that's part of you. The spirit proceeds from father and son. Your children proceed from you and your wife or your husband. They're a part of you, very integral part, bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. And so there has to be in a family. We've lost all that, huh? But there has to be that love, powerful love, powerful love that forgives, love that is gentle and tender, tender even when hard correction is necessary. You say, well, that sounds real good, Mother. It is real good, and that's what God wants from all of us. But the world has separated father from mother, children from parents. But let's not look at the way things are. This is what God wants from you. I know that image is marred, but it cannot always be marred. It has to come back to what God desires, see? Now let's say, what does a, what does a single person do? I mean, how, how do they imitate Jesus? Jesus had for 30 years of a very quiet life. alone with his mother. All of you that are single, you imitate the hidden life of Jesus. You reap the fruits of prayer and meditation. Because you have an opportunity, you see, to read more, to accomplish more, to find out what was he like? Because that's how I should be. And so single people imitate the hidden life of Jesus. See, nobody is left out. There is just not one vocation. Now, if we go to religious, they all imitate Jesus in a different way. If you want to be a nurse, or enter an order that's a nursing order, you imitate the healing Jesus. If you want to teach, then you imitate the teaching Jesus, who spoke to multitudes in simple parables. And he was so lovable that the children would run and sit on his knee hold his hand, and the apostles got angry one day and said, oh, why don't you send these kids away? Making all this noise and yakety yakety all together at the same time. And the Lord, you know what he did? He took one, and boy, what did he do? He put it on his lap. Can you imagine Jesus doing that to your child? And he said, leave him alone. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you solemnly, unless you become as one of these little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh boy. What does that mean, huh? Well, let's look at these kids around Jesus. They were unafraid. More afraid of the apostles than Jesus. They were happy to be there. They were simple. And they loved him. They didn't know why. They couldn't explain the parable of the sower of the seed. They didn't know anything about that. They saw love and they ran. That's what a teaching and a nursing 
and a social worker as the religious should do. They imitate the teaching Jesus. The, the people were so anxious to hear him, they forgot to eat for three days. There wasn't one Italian among them. <laughs> I know that for sure. No Italian listens to anybody for three days without eating. These people were so hungry on a spiritual level. They wanted something. They wanted someone who could reach out and touch them and say, the Father loves you, and he's prepared a kingdom for you. And I can imagine one of the kids saying, oh, what's it like? And he'd say, well, there's all kind of mansions there. There's beautiful things that you'll, we've never seen here. Colors that don't even exist in your world. And one kid would say, purple, no, more than that. Green, no, better than that. Yellow, hmm. What's it like? He'd say, well, one day you'll find out. And then one kid would come up and say, can I go with you? And he'd look and say, no, not now. The master spoke to children. And somehow they understood what the adults didn't. They didn't understand. Now, that's for religious who are nurses and teachers and social workers, if they lose the reality that they imitate the healing power of Jesus, the teaching power of Jesus, the healing power, the loving power, and the merciful power of Jesus. That's, it doesn't matter you know, yesterday we had the cure of ours. He couldn't study Latin. He just couldn't catch on. He did very poorly in school. <clears throat> After the revolution, they needed priests. The director went to the bishop. He said, well, we, we got the Jean-Marie. He said, oh, not very bright, uh-uh. I have a dummy, oh yeah, can't learn, right. Failed most of his grade, correct. Is he pious? Oh yes, he prays like an angel, ordain him. And he did. Where did they put him? In a far away city, simple, very few people, 250, I think, a village where people didn't worship. They didn't keep Sunday, Holy Sunday. They didn't, they planted, they worked all day Sunday. They danced all night and they got drunk. What a place to go, huh? But see, if he was very smart, he would have walked around and went back. But he wasn't smart in the way of the world. He met a little boy, but he couldn't find ours, you see. And he said to the boy, show me ours, and I will show you heaven. Ooh, he was bright. The boy he said that to became a priest later on. He went to church and he tried to, he went to Mass, he said Mass on Sunday wasn't a person in that church, not a one. So we went out in the streets 
and he started preaching from the from the steps and he with that squeaky high-pitched voice that grind on your nerves you ever hear a squeaky high-pitched voice huh yeah and he'd say oh whoa it's you oh. you're drunk every night Oh, he laid it on. We can't do that today, you see, because we want to hurt anybody's feelings. He didn't care. Took him a while, and all of a sudden, one day, he turned around, and the whole place was full. He converted 250,000 people. He heard confessions 15 hours a day. And if you didn't tell him your sins, he told you. <laughs> what a guy, huh? <laughs> you went in there prepared. And when I went to ours, some years ago, I went and I put my head in the confessional. Boy, if that place could talk, huh? But I put my head where he would have sat, and I looked in. I said, Lord, you know, I don't want to ask for big things. If, though, I rub my hand against the wall here and a splinter happens to fall, <laughs> may that's a big thing, Lord, for you, to let a splinter fall from a holy man's confessional. I'm not asking for big things. A splinter. There it was. Wow. I looked at that splinter and I thought, this man who knew nothing of the world and the priests there were so angry with him. He wore the same cassie for months years. There was everything on it. The milk he drank, the soup. <laughs> he didn't care. So they wrote to the bishop a long letter saying he should be removed from this place. And he found it. And uh, they all signed it and he signed it too. Way at the bottom. <laughs> Jean Vianney Curie of ours. Mm -hmm. What a man. He imitated the preaching Jesus and the merciful Jesus. That is his vocation. He brought down his hands and the words he spoke brought down for these people, ungrateful that they were, the Eucharist, in such a holy way that the worst of them came and were converted. Wow. Now, there are brothers who have vocations. Who are they? They're not priests, right? But they do the things a priest can't do. And without them, a priest would have little time. So who do they imitate? What do they imitate in Jesus when he was a carpenter and made furniture for people who were very dissatisfied? What is this? It's the chair you ordered. It's crooked. It's crooked. The God who made the world. Are you nuts? But you know what Jesus would say? Well, where is it crooked? Well, I don't know. Looks crooked. Where? I don't know. I'd be happy to change it for you. You know what I'd say? <laughs> I wouldn't say anything. I would take the chair and wrap it around his head. <laughs> <laughs> but I am not Jesus, do you see? <laughs> but brothers imitate the working Jesus, the servant of servants. 
the Jesus who knelt at his apostles' feet and washed them. The Jesus who said to Peter, when Peter said, oh, wait a minute, you're not going to wash my feet. He washed all the others, though, and Peter was saying, what's the matter with that guy? He's not letting those who wash his feet. What a humiliating thing. Why don't they do something about it? Ah, now he comes to Peter. And Peter lets out all his anger. You're not going to wash my feet. No, way. What did Jesus do? Pour the water on his head? No. Oh, Peter, he said, if I do not wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me anymore. Oh, what a threat. Why? Because if Peter did not understand how to be a servant and how to help, he couldn't be a leader. Couldn't. So that's the life of a brother. They imitate the working Jesus. And now there are sisters we talked about. And then there are contemplatives, like our community, Carmelites, Visitandines, many, many. Who and what of Jesus' life do we imitate? We imitate the prayer life of Jesus. I'm sure when you look at the life of Jesus, who is only here among us 33 years, and he spent 30 alone with his mother, 30 out of 33. We imitate the 30 years of prayer to the Father. We imitate the Jesus who went away for 40 days twice to pray to the Father for the rest of us. The Jesus in the garden who for three hours prayed and he came back and the, the teachers were asleep. He said, pray for me. Pray that you don't enter into temptation, that you're not put to the test. Uh, he asked you and I and we are contemplatives to be that Jesus. He asked us to take vows of poverty, to have, to love without counting the cost. To give up everything for his sake to be with him, to love him, to adore the Father, to say, Lord, we're sorry for all the sins in the world. Have mercy on us. Day and night, we imitate the Jesus who cried over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. If you only knew the one who visits you. <sighs> but you would not. We imitate that Jesus who reached out and wanted so much to be accepted by his own and was rejected by his own. We imitate the Jesus who would get up very early before dawn and kind of sneak away from his apostles who again were always sound asleep. And he'd go out somewhere, sit on a rock or kneel on the ground, pray to his father 
Prague. Father, he said one time, I thank you for hiding these things from the wise and the prudent, revealing them to little ones, those who have faith. <coughs> we imitate Jesus by having only one love. We give up all other love for his. And then we imitate Jesus by loving, by giving up, giving away anything at all that would separate us from that one love, one love. And that love he was, not possessed, but the one he was, I am. The one who said to Moses, tell them, I am, has said to you. That Jesus is who we imitate by taking a vow of obedience. He's sitting near a well one day and he met a woman who was living with, at different times, five different men. And there he was, very tired, waiting for her. As we who are before his presence, day and night, wait. As the mother waits her wayward child for sinners to come home. And he said to her, go call your husband. And she said, I have none. Oh, he said, you have spoken rightly. You have had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. Oh, wow. A correction but made with love. That Jesus we imitate. And the priesthood for all of you who want to be priests, that is the greatest of all vocations. Married life is a sacrament. If we forget what part of the life of Jesus you are to be, to imitate, it will splinter. If a priest forgets that his life is that priesthood that brings down upon this earth the body, blood, soul, and divinity, that in his hands he says, this is my body. If you forget that, it will splinter. If a father forgets, that he is supposed to be like the Eternal Father, forever merciful, providing, creating. If a woman forgets, she is that gentle spirit that brings life into the world. If the children forget, they proceed from father and son, mother. Honor thy father and thy mother. Maybe it isn't like it should be, but we must ever have that goal in our mind, in hearts. You can't get in a car. All these people got in cars or buses or planes and came here today. What would happen if you went to the airport and say, I think I'll get out of this plane? And it went to Honolulu. I did that one time, but I didn't want to go to Honolulu. I was going to Miami. No, I wasn't going to Miami. That's where I was going, but I didn't want to go. Everybody, the stewardess to the captain says, well, ladies and gentlemen, we will be in Miami in an hour and a half. And I dropped my coffee 
So I said to sister, what did he say? She said, we're going to Miami. I said, we are not going to Miami. She said, we are now. <laughs> she looked at me like I wanted to open the door and say, sorry, Pari, we're on the wrong plane. Was a mistake, you know. Look at your state in life, and then look at this book, this awesome book, and find out what part of Jesus' life are you called to follow. It's in here. It's in here. Our extern sisters, for example, are both active and contemplative. They serve the people. They take our place. We owe them a debt of gratitude. And if I had the help to wash feet, I'd wash theirs. Why? Because they allow us, by their presence, dealing with all of you, to pray. a vocation of sacrifice and prayer. You see, all of us created by God for God and to be happy with him for all eternity. And we all have a part of this pie. And if you do not imitate Jesus in your state of life, no one will take your place. In heaven it shall be empty forever. Do you know we had a little movie years ago called Marcelino Pinevino? A little orphan. You ought, to, you ought to get it if you don't have it. Orphan that lived with a bunch of monks. And he went up to the attic one day and he saw Jesus on the cross. And he didn't understand. He got a little chair and he walked up and he touched him and he said, oh, why are you fastened to that tree, to that cross? The Lord came, one hand came down and said, that's where they put me. Oh, he said, I am so sorry. He said, are you hungry? And Jesus said, yes. Well, wait, he said, I'll get you something. The little kid runs down the step very quietly because he didn't want Brother Cook to hear it. And so there's nice, fresh bread there, all sliced, ready for supper, exact amount of slices. And he takes one slice from the middle and he pushes it together. <laughs> <coughs> and he runs up the step with a glass of water and he gives it to Jesus. And Jesus comes down and sits in a chair and he said, would you like some? Every day he goes up there and talks to Jesus. Sometime he brought him wine and Brother Cook looking around, what happened to the wine? <sighs> I had 30 pieces of bread every day, I got 29. And one day the brother decided to go up and find out what's he doing. He went up very quietly, opened the attic door, and he suddenly saw this young boy, little boy, talking to Jesus. And he was sitting in the lap of Jesus, and he said to Jesus, do you have a mother? And Jesus said, yes, I have a mother. Is she pretty? He said, oh, yes. He said, I don't have a mother. He said, I wish I had the money. She said, oh, you do. She's in heaven. Oh, is she pretty too? He said, oh, yes, she's very pretty. Well, could I come to heaven with you? He said, do you want to? He said, oh, yes. I would like to see your mother and mine. He said, all right. 
You just put your head right here, and then I'll take you to see my mother and yours. Well, that poor brother peeking through the door was about ready to die. He runs down and he calls all the brothers up and they run up and the light of God is still there. Jesus is still in that chair and then all of a sudden he's back on the cross. The boy is dead. A little boy who finally found out why he was created. A simple boy. Who did mind giving Jesus a crust of bread and a glass of water? And most of all, Jesus himself, who didn't mind at all talking to a little boy. So if you and I forever remember our vocation, no matter what other vocation you have, your primary vocation is to fill uh, the desire of God for you by in some way imitating his life. We have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. And uh, where are you from? I'm from Villa Grove, Illinois. Wonderful. What is your question? Well, Mother, um, today I had some sadness. Um, a friend of mine, Kathy, her husband was sick for uh, just a few hours. Mm. He was only 44 years old, and he died. Sorry. And um, my friend is so angry with God because she feels that her prayers were not honored. We were all praying and saying rosaries, and she just feels so angry with God because she feels that he, her husband was taken from her so young. She has two um, grown uh, sons, but she doesn't understand, Mother. And I'm trying to, to get the words to say to her, do you have some, some, something I can give to her? It's hard, I, hard. And, you, and I know you understand. And if we look at it on a, a natural level, on a human level, it seems unjust, unfair. But God is infinite wisdom. Maybe he would have had something that was extremely painful for years and years and years and years. And maybe the Lord knew he couldn't take it, neither would she or could she. And he took him at that point, he would suffer less. That's very possible with our merciful Jesus. Sometimes things like this are his permitting will. And sometimes his ordaining will. Whatever it is, it is a great cross. Now she needs to imitate Our Lady. Could Our Lady have said, Father, you gave me your son? Why? He healed the sick, and the sick are saying, crucify him. He healed the blind and the leper, and those who were rotting away, and those dead, he, he made them rise. Why, Father? No, she didn't do that. She saw everything as our Lord saw it. Before Pilate, standing before an unjust, weak judge. We have a lot of those today. Saying to him, answer me. Don't you know I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? And he said, no. You have no power over me, except what is given you about. At that awesome moment of injustice, the most gross injustice, that we crucify and scourge our God, he put him straight. Our Lady stood at the cross. 
every pain he had, she had. Not in degree, because he was God, but only in a degree that only a mother can suffer for her child. She said, thy will be done. She didn't question that he decided, and the father decided to save you and me and this woman and her husband by an ignominious death early in life, 33. Maybe you can explain that. But she needs to just go before the Blessed Sacrament and say, Father, like your mother gave you to the Father, I give my husband to you. Don't be angry. You lose an awesome opportunity to make a giant step in holiness. We have another call. Hello? Hi, Mother. Hi. Hi, Mother Angelica. Uh, this is Paulette from Alameda. Uh-huh. And um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, I, I, have, I think I have a vocation to suffer. Um, I've been suffering all my life, and when I was in my teens, I'm 55 now, when I was in my teens, uh, I offered myself as a victim, so I had, I had a lot of uh, uh, severe emotional, you know, mental suffering. And, um, and then I was an alcoholic addict. I got clean and sober later on in life, but, um, but then I had a, a severe accident, and I've been severely physically disabled. I'm mentally better, but physically in pain all the time. And I, was, I kept trying to do something else, to succeed at something, you know? And I've, it doesn't seem to work. It seems like the Lord just wants me to suffer. And, and I don't mean that derogatorily. I mean, it seems to be what he wants for me, you know? And I was wondering what, what you think about suffering as a vocation. Well, it is, no question about that. And, and the church has had many souls that were stigmatized. Padre Pio was one who suffered terribly and all the tzimata and the pain. There are many souls we call victim souls, and the reason we say that is because it seems their whole entire life is some kind of physical pain. I know what I'm going to say is going to make people jump out of their chairs, but you'll just have to jump because it's the truth. Uh, our dear Lord does allow and accept pain. In fact, St. Paul said, this is a wicked generation, a wicked age, and your lives, your lives should redeem it. Oh, what is he talking about? Jesus already redeemed us. We add. And then he said one day, I make up in my body what is lacking to the sufferings of Jesus. Oh, what is he, a heretic? <laughs> Jesus is God, you can't make up. But somehow the Lord accepts it and adds it to him, his own pain and offers your pain and my pain, everybody's pain with his pain to the Father for the salvation of souls. I would rejoice if you're living a holy life in pain Rejoice, you save many souls. And one day when that time calls, that awesome time when we see Jesus face to face, the day we call death is really life. And then you'll see hundreds and hundreds of people coming rushing towards you. And you'll say, Jesus, who are these? I don't know these people. Why are they rushing towards me? And he'll say, these are the souls you're suffering saved. They may have never have been saved without them. So rejoice. Yes, God does ask us. That's when I learned to be specific with God. <coughs> when I was threatened never to walk, and I to ask him, you know, Lord, I, uh, 
I'll build you a monastery in the south. I didn't even know why I said that. If you let me walk, I panicked. I forgot something, you see. I forgot to say walk without pay. Hmm. <laughs> From that time on, I became very specific with God. <laughs> if you don't mind, Lord, I would like it this way, this time, this place, you know? So, don't be afraid. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother? Yes, yeah, where are you from? Um, upstate New York. Oh, we love you so much here. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Um, I just wanted to share with you that um, the Lord chose for our family. Our first child is Down syndrome, and she's 16 now. And, of course, it wasn't anything we would have chosen ourselves. But if we hadn't have her as a gift in our lives, we would never have gained the need to depend on the Lord. And we fall in love with the Bible and Our Lady, and um, the Eucharist is just a stronghold for us to just meet everybody's needs and rejoice in what we have. Mm. And it's helped us kind of like take ourselves off of the first place and depend on other people a little bit more. And I just wanted to share that because it, I don't ever want anybody to think that a child with a handicap is is a negative it no. really can change your whole life into a much more of a positive and she has um her third heart surgery is coming up soon and i would wonder if you and the sisters would pray for her oh yes and we, we know have. if she ends up in heaven that she'll have a glorified body without her disability so we accept that too but oh listen in heaven we're all going to look like we're 33 healthy as <laughs> anything and we're going to run around that kingdom like nobody ever ran around. And let me tell you, a Down syndrome child is the greatest gift you could ever have. The greatest gift. They're innocent. They're very loving. Very united to God's will. And they're very, very happy. Very happy. I have one that's, that is a dear friend of mine. Yeah, well, I'm not going to get that one without breaking it up. Here we go. Um, I have one Down syndrome right here. Come up, here, sweetheart. You got to give me a hug, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the greatest friend I ever had and the greatest gift to her family. Do you want to say hi to all those people out there? Yes. What do you want to say to them? I want to say hello to all my people. And I know Mother Church is my one anything she said. <laughs> and, God, and God bless Mother Chalika. <laughs> God bless you, honey. Thank you. you whoop. <laughs> you see, who is great in the eyes of God? A child like this, who doesn't suffer from the frustrations and the greed, and the lust, and the ambitions of all the rest of us. If you have a Down syndrome child, get on your knees and thank God. You're sure of one of them. We have a lot of calls tonight for prayer. I'll do that now. Lord God, I hope we have reached all those who are uncertain, undecided, unloved, unappreciated, all those, Lord, who have forgotten thee, whose families are not the way you want them, whose lives are not the way you want them, we have forgotten. By whom we were created by you, for you, we forgot. And so, Lord, I ask that you give them all grace 
like self-knowledge, then we may come back to you with all our hearts, minds, and souls. And to help you do that, I'd like you to get this book called Ad Lib with the Lord. These are prayers I made up in various times of my life. Frustrations and needs, like a need to trust. <coughs> in this place, you gotta trust a lot. I give it to you for what? It's five dollars, what's five dollars? Two pack of cigarettes, huh? <laughs> Might save your soul. So write to me for ad lib with the Lord. And I know we've been getting some complaints about me asking for funds every day. I try to do it nicely. <sighs> but we reach all together between here and Europe and South America, 70 million homes. Isn't it strange? We still struggle, huh? So if you don't want to hear my voice anymore, We could go out there and find a few millionaires for a year. I wouldn't beg it for anything. Hey, I don't like to do it. There are a lot of millionaires listening to me tonight. You haven't given five nickels. <laughs> you thought I was going to say five cents, didn't you? <laughs> millionaires can give five nickels. <sighs> You're not going to take it with you. I got good news for you. We need this to tell the gospel and to show the people how they're loved by God. If you listen and the Lord is helping you, be generous. I happen to think this country needs this network. And we need you. Well, goodbye now. And I'll see you tomorrow night. God bless.